The Gospel of John, 14, verses 15 to 17, and 25 to 27. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask God, and God will give you a resistance spirit to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the resistant spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send in my name, will teach you everything, remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let yourselves be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, but I am coming to you. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, Jesus Christ our Liberator, and the Holy Spirit, our Resistance Counselor. Amen. Amen. Not the usual Trinitarian formula, is it, friends? Uh, <clears throat> I didn't invent it. I did not invent it. You might suspect me of having invented it, but I did not. This <clears throat> translation is by my teacher of theology, Frederick Herzog. Fred was a professor of theology when I was an entering student in the Master of Divinity at Duke. So in a sense, it spread to me and me to Jeff in terms of theology teaching. And Fred was very active against the Vietnam War, as was I. And he wanted to teach class on ratings against the Vietnam War. And it was at least my understanding as a student that they would not let him teach that class for credit. So Fred being Fred, let it be known in the seminary community that twice a week he would be in the crypt, I mean where they buried the dead people, below Duke Chapel. And he gave out a list of readings so that you could read and meet him in the crypt and discuss it. Very dramatic. You know, <laughs> I've been a seminary president, and I've often thought I adored Fred. I would have hated to have him on the back. <laughs> because it would be like having Jeremiah on the back. You know, like, Whoa, to you. Anyway, Fred was a great teacher, though. And um, when we met, he met in the crypt. He didn't get any credit for it. Of course, it was the most powerful class I took in seminary. Now, this is not wholly Fred's translation. He was working on this translation, and he shared portions of it from 1970 to 1971 as we were doing this class in the crypt. He published in 1972. It's a translation of the Gospel of John, which does, in fact, translate Paraclete as resistance spirit or resistance counselor. And Fred felt that was where the Holy Spirit was working during the Vietnam War. And, um, but Fred and I, and <coughs> Fred's wife, um, argued with him all the time about inclusive language. Fred did not use inclusive language. So the Holy Spirit told me to fix Fred's translation, <laughs> uh, which I did for you. So, um, but powerful, powerful to just translate paraclete as resistance spirit, resistance counselor. And there are four themes in that gospel text that I want us to take away from here this morning. Resistance spirit, spirit of truth, Jesus talks about, 
And those two are closely related. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, and do not be afraid. Four things. Now, what did we read in the crypt? We read some of the Gospel of John, but we read Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a German theologian. He spent a short amount of time at Union Theological Seminary in New York. He went back to Germany because he felt that he needed to be part of the resistance to Hitler, and he was hung by the Nazis for doing that. And I knew that Fred wanted us to be the kind of Christians that Bonhoeffer brought together in what was called the Confessing Church in Germany. Because the German Christians rolled over and let Hitler rub their tummies and say, oh yes, Hitler, you're the second coming of Christ. And certain German pastors and German Christians broke off from that. Many of them died for this. Many of them were taken to Buchenwald and shot. Others survived to tell the story. Bonhoeffer did not. And he wanted us to be a resistance group, like the Confessing Church. And he focused on the Holy Spirit. Um, people are a lot of trouble thinking about the Holy Spirit. You know, if you ask people about the Trinity, and it's like two men and a bird, right? <laughs> What's up with that? So, um, and I think, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, one of the problems we have as Christians, and we haven't, you know, and I've talked a lot about Jesus, and i talked a lot about God in the last two days, but getting the idea of what the Holy Spirit is and how it works, not only with individuals, we have perpetrated a highly individualized uh, view of the Holy Spirit, that it's, you know, the, you raise your hands and you shout, it's all right, you want to raise your hands, you want to shout, dance around the sanctuary, the Spirit was here this morning. Right? Felt it. You felt it. I mean, there's a spirit in the place. As an individual, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'm feeling the spirit with me. But the neglect of the communal aspect of the Holy Spirit and the movement of the spirit in society, the resistance spirit, I mean, I, I went to the Women's March in Washington, D.C., and when 2.9 million people get out in the street around the world, something's going on. And I, the, the sound, it was the sound. There was like this roar. Uh, not an angry war, but a kind of <laughs> uh, 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 people being together, united in a common purpose. Now, for me, this was a faith commitment. For those of us who marched in D.C., we gathered at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Washington, pastor, guy I went to seminary with, and he blessed us, and he commissioned us for this march. And I believe, as we participate in writing for the public square, speaking out, maybe standing, holding a sign, but that is commissioned work when we do it as people of faith. Um, the Holy Spirit will blow where it will. It's not something we can control. But I believe, and I believe to this day, that Fred was right, that the spirit of resistance to that horrible war, and I became an anti-war activist in high school, as a junior, because guys I knew who had graduated a year two ahead of me were coming back in body bags 
And my high school originally had put the names and pictures of people who had died in Vietnam, who had gone to our high school, on the wall. And then they stopped because there were so many of them. And I left. I was raised a Lutheran. I left the Lutheran church in college because the local United Church of Christ was standing on the street corner across from my campus, Smith College, every night holding candles and signs against the Vietnam War. And it was a busy thoroughfare. And I'd come home from class and I'd see him, and I'd come home from class and I'd see him. And one day I just walked across the street and I picked up a candle and I joined the United Church of Christ. <laughs> because they stood there. Fred wrote a book called God Walk. You know, enough with the God talk. If you don't walk the walk, don't pretend you can talk the talk. God Walk has to be part of God Talk or it's hypocrisy. Now I believe that we as Christians also don't own the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is there through all religions, through humanist values, takes different language, different descriptions, but it's a movement far beyond what we as Christians may say and do, but it is powerful and needs to be central in how we approach the work of God. Now, what about between marches around us? You know, even between uh, what you write. You write something, let me tell you the truth about this. You write something about what you feel your Christian faith calls you to witness for and against in the public square, and you get that published, there's a high to that. And everybody at the church goes, oh, I saw your compliment. I mean, it feels great. <laughs> of course, I have, a, I have a set of trolls that follow me around. They don't think it's so great, but too bad. Um, but there is also a movement. Friends and I, I mean, you meet people in the marches. I met a group of women from Smith College. Said 2020, they were carrying their, they were going to graduate 2020. And I went up to them and I said, it's uh, my 50th reunion, 20 and uh, I can't believe it. I'm still marching. <laughs> and, but, you know, I talked to them. They're unchurched young people. They say they're spiritual but not religious. Spiritual but not religious is the fastest growing category in American religious life according to the Pew Foundation. Spiritual but not religious. And I have said, and I have written about this, if you want to be spiritual but not religion, religious, okay, but you're going to be hungry in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is, the spirit, that wonderful power of the march, power of witness in the public square, um, that's the sweetness of faith. Right? It's like a sugar high. And you know what this is? This is the fiber. This is the fiber. This is that I'm sick and we'll show up because you need to get to the clinic. You've got to have some fiber in your religious life or it's all just march high. Oh dear, I feel alone. The most common response of millennials to how they feel about society is, I feel alone. I feel alone. But this is our fault. This is our fault. This is not the fault of these millennials. A friend of mine, a close friend, Talk to me about, he was in despair, his adult daughter had left the church. And I said to him, Harold, 
Your daughter didn't leave the church. The church left your daughter. She's a lesbian. They're Presbyterian. <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> Don't blame. Don't blame your daughter. Blame the church that gave her the message you ain't good enough. Why do people under 30 feel like they're all alone to try to find spiritual meaning? They, I believe, have not abandoned religious institutions. Religious institutions have abandoned them. <coughs> we have not protected the young from predatory sexual abuse. We have not welcomed and included whoever you are and welcome here. You know, there's a difference between tolerance and full inclusion. Right? Have we listened to what LGBTQ people have to say in terms of how we need to change Christian theology? You know, I teach a lot of LGBTQ students, and they have come from uh, conservative, uh, sometimes abusively fundamentalist backgrounds. And I had a, a guy in He's trying to use this conservative theology, but sort of, you know, make it gay. <laughs> and I was like, fussed at him and said, what is the point of God making you gay if you don't use it? Right? It's a gift. It's a spiritual gift. Because it immediately must challenge that dualism that runs like a, a fault line through the history of Christianity. You know, boys over here, girls over here. You know, that, you take that, and I talked about the dualism of good and evil. Boys over here, girls over here. And the dualism of good and evil are related. You know, you divide things up into it's going to be a boy thing and a girl thing. It's going to be an evil thing. It's going to be a good thing. There's a gift. It's different than just saying we include you. The poor. The poor. The face of the other. That came up in one of our writers' groups. How do you challenge the othering of other Americans who are racial ethnic minority? I'm don't know how many of you read about the incident at Starbucks in Philadelphia. Two African American men came in, they sat down, they, as it turned out, they'd been waiting for a third friend, but they didn't order anything. And the manager called the police and they were arrested. You know, in this in this day and age, it's all on video, right? They're just sitting there trying to live while black. But you know what? It is dangerous to try to live while black. Other patrons in the Starbucks can be heard saying to the police, they were doing nothing. Don't arrest them. Now the manager of Starbucks says, oh, sorry, 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 and so on and so on. How would we in our writers' groups write about this today? Jesus goes to Starbucks, and the Romans show up. All right? What is, we know from a civil rights perspective why this is wrong, okay? But from a theological perspective, if you cannot see the face of Jesus in the person whose skin color is different from you, who may be differently abled, who is LGBTQ, whatever it is, if you can't see, the face of Jesus in that person, you are no kind of Christian. Amen. And that's the voice we have to bring to the public square. Yeah, it's civil rights broken, but the theological offense is huge. And you know, <laughs> the Romans did show up, and they did arrest Jesus. Why? Because he had a different opinion about what ought to be going on in the temple. And he had a different opinion about how you should treat the poor. 
And yet a different opinion about tax collectors, about prostitutes, about sinners. And Jesus is saying, against the temple authorities, you're going to go into heaven after the prostitutes. Right? They're religious authorities, you know, they're I like that. <laughs> and, but the civil authorities were mad because he thought, they thought he would cause insurrection. He had a resistance spirit. And a resistance spirit is incubated just in individuals, not just in marches and rallies, but in communities that are welcoming. The most powerful words you can say are, you are not alone. You know that um, Verizon, old Verizon man, where the guy's out there uh, and he's got no cell phone connection. You know, advertisers know what people crave. People crave connection. And he's enormous with no connection. And suddenly, engineers and uh, technicians and wire people, they all show up. And he's not alone. But what's the conservative message today? You're on your own, sucker. You can't have health care. You can't have retirement benefits. You can't even have a sick day. You're on your own. On your own. There's no such thing as the common good. But the peace of Christ is connection. The peace of Christ is the disciples connected to one another, of them not giving up, even after violence. They had each other's backs. How many, literally, lives could we save if we were able to take that message into the public square? You are not alone. You are not alone. We, in this church, we've got your back. That's, my dear friends, what I, Fred, was trying to help us realize in that controversial translation from the Gospel of John. Grace and peace.